Dave, I'm really excited about this uh, this coming month. Uh, we're going to have the 17 year cicadas. 17 years ago, Brad, the cicadas emerged, terrorized the New England coasts, and then went back underground. I love that it's 17 years. It's so random. Yeah, it's that such these a bugs weird emerge number. every 17 years. Yeah, it's like it's like a uh, insect quinceanera. It's like well, what's going on here? They're, they're coming out every 17 years. Uh, so, I, now listen, as a, as a as a not at all uh, biologist, why is it 17 years? Does anyone know what that cycle I is? Honestly, don't know. It, 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 because it's also what is that. Uh, what is that like Fibonacci sequence? You know, it's it's a very it it, it, it seems like if you're gonna find uh, an answer to that, and it's right. gonna be like a Fibonacci number or something. Or like that has if, to yeah, do if with, it was a prime number or some weird yeah. thing that nature's keyed into. But 17 is so weird. Yeah, it's it's very strange. I'm trying to remember now. I, I my son has pointed out that I've lived in Philadelphia longer than I've lived any place else. So I'm officially. A Philadelphian now. Yeah. So uh, for those for those listening at home, Bad Axe can no longer claim Brad as no. uh, although a native son. They can still claim you as a native son, but they cannot claim you as a resident, as you've now lived no. in Philadelphia longer than Bad Axe, Michigan. That's oh. right. Uh, officially, and and I got to tell, I, I honestly think of myself as a Philadelphian anymore. Like I, 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 I that's kind of how I identify. You, yeah. well, you handle yourself like a Philadelphian. You still oh. have the Midwest nice in you, but there's a little bit more pepper in you than there than there was when you <laughs> left Bad Axe, you know? <laughs> I've been listening back to the the show that's uh, public right now, and Salty Geiger came out a lot, especially towards the end of the show. Well, so when I'm walking with you across the street, as soon as one foot starts to go into the pedestrian walkway, the middle fingers start to come out without even a car coming by. <laughs> and I'm like, oh, that's the Philadelphia in him preparing, just in case. Yeah. A cab comes reeling around the corner, and you've got to get it ready. You know that. Kind that's of thing. right. That's right. I'm priming, but I'm, I'm trying. <laughs> I'm trying to remember if I, 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 I like took note uh, of the cicadas last year. They would have been, or in uh, 17 years ago, I would have been around for this. But I don't remember like taking real note of them. I'm, I'm gonna have to listen. A part of it is I've got tinnitus, so my ears are always ringing. The cicadas. So you don't notice one... trillions of bugs. <laughs> <laughs> for, for the longest time, when I was a kid, I thought the cicadas was just all in my head. I just thought I was making the sound up. I'm like, oh, that's just a sound that my ears make in the summer. <laughs> Well, I got to back us up here because I'm realizing for some international listeners or from people on the West Coast, they might not know what a cicada oh. swarm is. And yeah. so uh, we should give a little bit of context. So in the next couple weeks here, we're recording this before it has happened. In the next couple weeks here, on mainly on the East Coast, the Upper East Coast of, of the United States, there is a bug that basically self-submerges in the larvae stage, right, into the soil. Yeah and mm -hmm. only emerges as this giant swarm of trillions of insects once every 17 years. Yeah. They fly around for how many days, Brad? Like five, six days, a couple weeks, and then they all get crunchy and they done. They have a very short lifespan. Yeah, yeah, very short lifespan. Yeah, and then they crunch and die underfoot, and it's disgusting, but I guess yeah. it's great for gardening for a while there, right? It, it adds a lot of protein to the soil. Absolutely, and, and the birds love it. But it, it, if you've never seen one, it, look it up on Google real quick. It's a prehistoric-looking insect. Very large, a uh, very uh, threatening looking. <laughs> it's a beetle, basically, with very big wings. And what happens, they come out, uh, uh, they finally hatch as adults, and they've got these very large wings. And the sound that you hear is them flapping their wings really, really hard to dry their wings. That's a whole process of them drying oh, that's their what wings. That's what they're doing? They're drying their wings? Yep. That's of 17 years of moisture, God. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you'd, you'd make a little noise if you had 17 years of uh, of dampness that you had to get rid of as well. Uh, and, and so that's that's the sound they make. And it's really, it's that they're fascinating insects. So I, I know I'm asking a city boy this, so you might not know the answer. But if, if we lived on a farm, say, in somewhere on the East Coast, right, and we were plowing a field or digging a hole or anything, would we come across a bunch of cicada larvae or would we oh, not even notice them? That's a really good question. I don't know. I don't know how deep they – because you got to figure they've got to go really deep. Because yeah, if otherwise you're, the frost if, would hit them, right, uh, if they were right on the surface. Not only the frost, but last year's plow would have hit them. Uh, you know, right. at, at some point, they 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 they've got to be deep enough so that they're really protected from all of that. But but uh, but I don't honestly know the answer to that question. 
It's it. Their site. Their life cycle is a little bit like trying to rouse me to get to class in college. It was like, oh, I'm 17 years. Gotta go. Gotta go. Gotta get going. Smoke. Oh, why? Why did I schedule a little Thursday morning class at 8 a.m.? Yeah. This is stupid. And with such a short life, could you imagine if you slept in one day? That's a quarter of your life gone. Oh my God, imagine being the cicada that oversleeps and you're like, yeah. guys, guys, and everybody's dead around you. You're like, but there was time now, time enough at last to read. <laughs> <laughs> There's one creature that does not need a snooze button. <laughs> Jim the cicada. Ah, oh, shit, I missed it again. Uh, and on that note, I'm going to say hello, everybody, and welcome to Comic Lab, the show about making comics. And making a living from comics, I'm Brad Geiger, the editor of webcomics.com and the creator of Evil Inc. And I'm his friend Dave Kellett, cartoonist of Drive and Sheldon and co-director of the documentary Stripped. And this week's hour of comics advice is made possible by your support at patreon.com slash comic lab. So Dave, Dave, let's talk comics. Let's talk comics, my friend. You know what's funny? I threw the word documentary in there, and I saw you go, what? What's happening? What? <laughs> you, like, the rhythm was kind of broken up. I it was. Like, was. Oh, okay, he's, you we're know what's doing funny? I don't know why I threw documentary. I, was, I actually, by accident, I came across Stripped on iTunes the other day and watched the first, I don't know, 15, 20 minutes on iTunes. And yeah. uh, that movie holds up. It, it holds up, That Brad. movie holds up very well. I watched it just recently. I think I played it uh, la uh, at some point for one of my classes at uh, U University of the Arts. And it holds up beautifully. It, it really is a, a delightful show. One of my favorite interviews in that movie was Kathy Geisweit of Kathy, who I had neither... Uh, I guess at the time of the time of the interview, I did not know well enough of her personally that I had yeah. formed an opinion. But I came out of the interviews with her and just thought she's an amazing person. Kathy's an amazing person. Yeah. And I have actually reached out to her to come on this podcast. So we'll see if she if she kindly uh, takes out the invite. I would love to talk with her about what she thinks about uh, cartooning in this moment, five years on from when yeah. I interviewed her for Strip. So uh, yeah. hopefully she'll she'll say yes to that. But Brad, we got a big show today because we got a lot of topics that have come in from readers. But I wanted to talk, first yeah. of all, in in a, uh, a little bit of... Um, of realism to talk about mm -hmm. our 2020 because I actually don't know how your finances come came in, but I having finished up tax season, uh, have a printed out P and L in front of me here for my corporation. And, yeah. uh, in a way that I think is worth sharing to people, because a lot of times we only share our highlight reels with the world, you know, like, look mm -hmm. at me constantly onward and upward. Nothing can stop me. Pew, 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 I'm amazing. You know, that kind of thing. Yeah. And, yeah. uh, having, having listened recently again to Lucy Bellwood's, uh, episode, uh, and, um, Erica Mullen's episodes, I, I'm mm -hmm. reminded that it's good to share that there are hiccups along the road. And so yeah. for me, my finances, Brad, for the company, uh, and my cartooning, we're down uh, almost 30, or yeah, almost 29, 39% uh, for 2020. And it's the first year since 2007 that my income has gone down in my cartooning. But wow. I wanted to share it because it's not just a highlight reel of constant success for me. And it's right. worth acknowledging that there are hiccups along the road. And if, if uh, we have a second, I would love to talk about, because it plays off of MK's question from last week about life events, yeah. how sometimes careers have to take a beat for life events. So how did you get through that? I mean, how, so in other words, uh, looking back on 2020 and a 30% dip, uh, uh, does that affect how you plan 2021? Uh, you know what? It does in the sense that I, like everyone else probably in America, am looking towards the 20s now and like, Roaring twenties, here I come. Uh, yeah. It's going to be, it's going to be Dave with a renewed sense of purpose in the, in the twenties. Um, but, uh, what it does do, I, I, I think I told you this towards the beginning of the pandemic is that Beth and I, uh, Beth, my wonderful assistant and I had a FaceTime call towards the beginning of the pandemic. And we were talking about how things could possibly go. And in my mind, I, I was gaming out like, all right, Spanish flu took about two years to get herd immunity. We might be in this for about two years. So I was like, here's the goal, Beth. Our goal now is just to make my salary and make your salary. That's my whole mm -hmm. goal. Not not even profiting necessarily in terms of the corporation socking away any money, not building for some amazing future. Right now, it's just I make my salary, you make your salary. That's it. That's fine. If we can do that during a pandemic, great. And right. Um, right. So for I also so that was a really helpful conversation for us because it sort of reset the parameters because literally a month before you and I had been talking about five year goal, three year goal, one year oh, goal. Oh, yeah. 
And my my emergency response to being hit with a pandemic was, no, you know what? Now I just go into survival mode. And I think yeah. people saw during the year in moments I tried to thrive, and I, I think I did in some respects. But I also am part of a team. And my wife and I, as we as I've shared with on the show before, the metaphor we use between ourselves is two mountain climbers. And yeah. one of us will climb up a little bit on the a corporate, or not the corporate, the, uh, the personal career path. Yeah. Stake in, tink, 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 tink. And then the other one will come loose from their stake and they'll try to scramble up above the other one, right? And so right. we have a little bit of safety. And right before the pandemic, uh, Gloria had just signed with uh, Amazon TV for her new series. Mm -hmm. And so, um, and frankly had a, uh, a group of 10 to 12 people staring back at her in a Zoom writer's room every day. <laughs> Whereas I just had Beth and I. So basically yeah. I said in, in our coupledom, I said, you know what? I will take the, the homeschooling. I will take care of helping your parents. You take care of your 10 to 12 employees in the writer's room and your new show. And my yeah. cartooning this year is going to take a little bit of a hit. And I actually think that was the wise decision for us as a couple, you know. Um, but I wanted to, to broach it because I was curious to see how, how you felt about your year looking back on it now that we've done our taxes. Well, I finally got my taxes back from my CPA. And uh, I, I, for me, I held just about the same. I had uh, an uptick of about 6%. So like a rounding error almost, you know, not a rounding error, but very, very close to what right. I had right. uh, the year before. So I was able to kind of uh, kind of hold the hold the line. The, the main reason for that would have been probably the Kickstarter because the Kickstarter for me, as you remember, we were going into just the beginning of the pandemic. And it was a time when a lot of people were like, ah, oh, should I do a Kickstarter? Should I not? And my philosophy was this is the best time to do a Kickstarter because everybody shut up inside their houses. <laughs> they want <laughs> digital entertainment right. and they want something exciting. They want something with a low price point or a manageable price point. And they want something that's going to end up getting delivered to them. Uh, and they don't have to leave the house to get something that just shows up on their doorstep. Well, that's a Kickstarter for the most part. Uh, so I, my Kickstarter uh, kind of made the difference o uh, over the rest of the year. Uh, my Patreon luckily stood uh, very, very steady. There was, mm -hmm. there was very little uh, change in that. Uh, uh, but I, again, I made a, a real effort to make sure that those exclusives uh, content uh, posts were hitting time after time after time. Uh, uh, so I kind of lucked out for the most part. I was able to hold steady. Uh, but you know, at, at, at the same time, uh, it could have very easily gone another way. You know, it could, it could have easily hiccuped as well. Yeah. It's, uh, I'm, first of all, I'm super glad that, that your year uh, was able to hold steady. Uh, and I think that speaks to, uh, Patreon's ability to be a, What's the phrase? Like an even keel in a storm kind of a thing, you know, yeah. like yeah. Uh, because it's so distributed um, and and once it's established, it can really do a great job in terms of um, of keeping your career income on a steady plane. Like for me, though, the two kickers uh, the two main kickers, uh, there's some other ones that were smaller hits to my income this year. But like my Kickstarter, instead of doing my normal two Kickstarters a year, I was only able to do one. And it was yeah. a not very effective uh, Kickstarter for Sheldon, a Sheldon collection. And so my Kickstarters were down 26,000 for year to year. My yeah. Comic Cons were down twenty four thousand year to year, and then there was Ooh. something else. I can't, I'm looking across the piano. So, like Comic Cons, how do I replace that? There's no way to like right. Kickstarter. I know why that dropped. Um, yeah. it, it's because I, I just didn't have the time. I didn't have the bandwidth to do uh, a whole second Kickstarter in a year where I was homeschooling. Well, um, and not and only that, but you had launched one Kickstarter that you had prepared in 2019, and you were ready to go in 2020. Oh, uh, that's and, true. And, but then, yeah, yeah, because you, you were going to launch a, a TV series, and uh, at the end of the day, you were like, "I don't want to do this <laughs> because it's going to mean having all kinds of people come into my house, lighting techs and camera directors and camera people, and so on and so forth." Uh, yeah. so it was like, nah, I don't want to do this. So then you kind of very quietly just let that Kickstarter find its natural place. And it was, it, you, I, at some point you weren't pushing it quite as much. Uh, cause I remember I asked you, I said, dude, how come you're not pushing this thing? And you, you're like, Brad, 
if this Kickstarter goes, I'm going to have to have a bunch of people in my house. And I just don't that this is yeah. not the time for that. So you had a Kickstarter that, that you had ramped up for in 2019 that you had to kind of back off a little bit in the middle of the uh, stream. So you were dealing with a lot of things that were coming at you at that point. Thank you for reminding me of that, because I actually had forgotten about that project where that I don't remember what the goal set was, but it was somewhere in the seventy five to one hundred thousand dollar range because, you know, film yeah. was incredibly expensive. And sure. so we had filmed two test interviews, which went wonderful, but which costs, I don't remember, 10 or 15,000 a pop to record. And, yeah. um, and then we were one gearing of them went up. a little even better than the other one. As I remember, you had two good <laughs> ones. They were both good. I think one of them I thought might be, maybe was by the way, one of them was maybe the way, about six percent better. <laughs> so um anyway and yes so yeah so when you're we had a lot both beth and i and fred had a lot yeah. of uh full days devoted to that in our early 2020 yeah. that basically just got thrown into the trash bin yep. at least for about yep. 18 months like we're going to come back and do it again but yeah. all of those pro all of the project uh graphics that i worked on all of the mm -hmm. video feed that, that fred had been working on and editing all the color timing and all that sort of stuff all wasted because we can't do the full show now um anyway yeah. yes you're right that was and that's january and february right out the window right and so that was going to be the big kickstarter for the year so then i was left yeah. with the smaller sheldon kickstarter which was basically supposed to be a fan oriented uh filler you know not a, not a huge money spinner but an okay money yeah. spinner but uh anyway so between that and the loss of Comic-Con incomes, of which I tend yeah. to go to about three a year. Now, did you say 24,000 you went down because of comic conventions? From 2019, yes. So you were out 24 zero, But that's zero, gross. Zero. That's gross, not net. So like, t t right. keep in mind, there's also my expenses that that right. got, right, got right. thrown in the trash bin too. For So these are all my, my when I say I was down 30% for the year, that's all my gross, not my net. Yeah. Um, yeah, yeah. A lot of my expenses were actually wiped away because I didn't do a second book, which, you know, those print runs are expensive. I didn't go yeah. to a Comic-Con and those are expensive to go to. So my net is not as painful as my gross being down, but boy, my gross is like, took a, took a shot. But <laughs> I want to say though, because this is important. It, again, it goes to MK's question from last week about life events. Sometimes you just have to be at peace and, and be kind to yourself that it's not yeah. always, we're on a rocket to the moon, you know? Sometimes <laughs> there are yeah. years in life, there are years in life when there's a death in the family or when there's yeah. a global pandemic where you're just kind of doing <laughs> the best you can, you know? Yeah. And you're literally doing the best you can. And and uh, I'm actually quite happy that m the goal was was met. We made our two salaries and that's fine. Yeah. That's enough, you know? Yeah, and and, and sometimes that you got to claim... A a moral victory uh, over something like that, right? If, if, if nothing else, you, you were able to keep your head above water. You were able to pay Beth during that entire time. I'm sure she appreciates that as well. You know, she's like, because there was a lot of people getting cut loose at that point uh, in 2020 by a lot of panicking employers and so forth. Yeah. Uh, uh, you know, that it, it, it was a victory. It was a victory. It was. And in, in some respects, um, you know, the, a lot of the tasks that that Beth that falls under her purview as an assistant because yeah. of the pandemic, she was not able to do in terms of um, shipping out of the office was suddenly back on me again. And so that's right. A couple hours every week that's now back on me. And so uh, you don't think that that adds up, but that adds up over the course of a year, all that all that shipping and stuff. Of course it does. Um, so anyway. Uh, did. But here's the great things that came out of the pandemic for the studio. Beth and I definitely learned that if we want to, we could have a couple of days a week or, you know, week or two where she's working from home if we need to do yeah. it, you know, in the, in the year. Yeah. Ahead. That's kind of great. That's an amazing thing. I learned that I can downshift if I need to, because it's been year after year of self-motivated, like we're going to do better than last year. And then if I need to have a year where I'm like, you know what? No, mom and dad are having a little bit of trouble. We're going to slow down yeah. so that I can help yeah. them more. I can do that. And so it's nice. It's kind of nice to know. This is also me trying to put lipstick on a pig, but uh, it's nice to know that I could uh, downshift if I wanted to. Why did you give right. a, Why did you give a frown when I said lipstick but on a pig? I don't. I don't. Because I, I don't think it's lipstick on a pig. I really think that your 2020 was uh, was a success uh, in every way, shape, or form because you did what you set out to do. You're, monetarily, it was 30 percent less, certainly. But in terms of being able to stay on your feet and uh, uh, take the, the the punches as they were thrown and stay on your feet after that, I think that's a success. I think you claim a victory in that. 
I, and oh, I yeah. know I, Beth considers it a victory. Well, and one of the things, and this is worth talking about, uh, because we've said this on the show before, Brad and I, uh, every year we submit to the Eisners or the Harveys or the Hugos. Occasionally I'll do that yeah. one. Um, and every year we we do it knowing we're not going to win. But here's the bigger oh, thing. Yeah. The greatest award we could ever win, and we've said this time and time again, is mm -hmm. the ability to keep cartooning for another year. And that yeah. was kind of my goal for 2020 was like, yeah. nope, just keep it going so that 2021, you can come back strong again. Basically, just survive. That was what my goal yeah. was really in the year. And so in that respect, it did work, you know. In a way, I'm kind of glad to hear you're saying this uh, because knowing you as I do, and, and I know you because you're very much like me, <laughs> my first blush if you in that situation would be, I'm going to make back all that money I didn't make in 2020 and add on to it in 2021. In other words, I'm going to, I'm going to fill that gap in. I'm going to make up for lost time. I'm going to get that back. And I'm not hearing that from you. And I'm glad because I think that would be a mistake. I think you would, you would end up making errors in the other direction if you were to have that attitude, yeah, right? Yeah, you, yeah. That you're, that 2020 is not something that you feel the need to make up for it's something you did, you know, that we, everyone obviously did. And now it's on to bigger and better things in 2021. Yeah. And, uh, this is also one of those moments where, again, one of the bits of Brad's advice that I always love is worth sharing again, which is that this thing, this thing being a comics career is a marathon, not a sprint. And yeah. so if I worry so much about, I'm going to make up 2020 and 2021, <laughs> which by the way, 2021 <laughs> will be a fine year. And I think it'll be good. Yeah. But I don't think it'll make up for 2021 in terms of the losses. Right. Uh, I don't think anyway. Uh, but if I if I go into it trying to sprint through 2021 in order to catch up, that's not that yeah. that leads to burnout or mistakes or projects mm -hmm. that were misfiring because of overzealousness, you know, that kind of thing. Yeah, overextending. Whereas if I, ju if I just keep the course of working hard, putting my head down, having a renewed sense of uh, time management because the kids will be back in school, and I won't yeah. have to do so much for my elderly in-laws as, as much anymore. Uh, and um, I, I think just being back in the studio full-time, full-time, full-time will be a, a, a joy in and of itself. And I, and I won't have to reinvent the wheel and back into the marathon, not the sprint I go, you know? Yeah. Yeah. In other words, you're going to take the donut off. And I'll tell you what I mean. In, I know you're a baseball fan. When you're playing baseball and you're in the on deck circle, they've got that lead donut that you put on your bat. You swing the bat a few times with this heavy weight on it. It's really hard to swing the bat with a heavy weight on it. But when you're in the on deck circle, you're swinging that bat with the donut on it. Then when you get up to the plate, you take that donut off and all of a sudden you're swinging that bat like it's a feather. You're swinging it like lightning because you took the donut off. 2020 you had a you had a donut uh right around your neck <laughs> right you had you had you were doing homeschooling with the kids you were taking care of your your in-laws so on and so forth 2021 you're when when things start to go back to normal whatever the new normal is going to be uh but it's definitely got to be better than it was last year all of a sudden it, you're going to feel like you're lightning because you're not doing homeschooling. You're not doing care for the in-laws. You're going to feel like a superhero this year. I, I got to tell you, you see my face lighting up because I played baseball for like eight or nine years there. And the idea of a donut, for those of you that don't know it, it's such a perfect metaphor for this situation yes. because, yeah, it's this little uh, basically iron ring that you put around a bat and it adds, I don't know, what do you think? Five pounds, six pounds to it? There's five, different. Ten pounds. Yeah. Can't yeah. be can't be ten pounds. You're talking about a bowling ball. So five, six pounds. But your your coach always tells you, you know, take a few, take a few cuts with uh with a donut on and then go up to plate. I gotta tell you, can I uh, one of my proudest moments in baseball is yeah. uh I, I was so happy with myself. Or just before it was like eighth grade, ninth grade, something like that. I got into the all-star game oh, for, yeah. for our, our 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 baseball thing, right? Our league. Sure. And so I'm at the all-star game. I get up to the plate and my up my the umpire goes, "Hey champ, you forgetting something?" And I go, "What's that guy?" And he's like, uh, "You still got your donut on." I'm like, "All right, let me take that off." <laughs> like here I am, so proud of myself to be in the All Star game. Like, look at me, I'm really making it in the world. Oh, dumb shit, McGee still has his donut on his back when he gets up at the plate. The umpire's like, "Hey sport coat, why don't you take that off?" <laughs> oh man, did you? Get, now once you got the donut off, did you at least hit the ball? 
I, I, you know what? I remember doing perfectly fine, not stellar yeah. in uh, in yeah. All Star Game. I was I was a, a, a perfectly fine, but you're it, doing you're doing you did much better than me. This was you. You made the All Star Game. My baseball highlight as a kid was sliding into second base and not shitting my pants. That was the all time. <laughs> That was the all-time best I ever did. No. <laughs> they don't give trophies for that, by the way, Dave. They don't give a trophy for that. <laughs> and if they did, I don't want to see it. So as a kid, as an athlete, I always had incredibly strong legs and a, and a really underpowered upper body, right? Yeah. And oh, so yeah, I, I was that. not a power hitter. I didn't, I didn't hit, but I was great. Once you got me on the bases, I would steal bases left and right because I was super fast, yeah. right? Yeah. Uh, but... So this entire season, I don't hit a home run. The entire season, I don't hit a home run, right? Then the final game, we're up like 11 to 1, right? And it's the final yeah. inning, and I crank my first ever home run, and the team goes wild, and then I go to sit back down in the dugout, and my coach comes over, and he kind of pats me on the shoulder, and he goes, way to do it when it doesn't matter. <laughs> And isn't that a total baseball coach thing to say? Oh, like, hey, yeah. champ, way to yeah. do it when it doesn't make a difference. <laughs> yeah, took it right from the top, right down to the bottom with the cicadas. I, I don't know if you noticed, we're up by 10, so it's, uh, it really didn't make a difference there, champ. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> that was the only time I got put into the game is when our team was up by 10. That's the only time I saw playing time. So <laughs> at least you hit the ball. Let me ask you, because I, like you, I found my Patreon to be a North Star of steadiness for the year. Yeah. Um, yeah. Were there other things for you, because I've been talking too much, were there other things for you in 2020 that you're like, oh, turns out this is reliable and, and, I can, and steady and I can, I can keep this as one of the legs under my table? Well, listen, I mean, the first thing I got to talk about is uh, I, it, it's Patreon as well, but Comic Lab. Uh, our comic lab ba backers were there for us in 2020, uh, without a doubt, without a flinch. So I've got to, I've got to say thank you to that. Uh, but no, I, 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 there, I didn't, there wasn't any kind of revelation for me in that. I, I really did kind of put my head down and, uh, and decide I'm going to do everything I, I, that I did before. Uh, you know, I, 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 there wasn't any. Uh, there wasn't any big aha moment. It was all kind of doing Kickstarter and Patreon uh, and doing a lot of the stuff that I've done in the past. Uh, no, I, I'm, I'm, I, I'm letting you down there. <laughs> no, but no, I don't. Well, I don't have a good one for that one. Can I tell you this, though? Uh, one thing that there, there are two other creators in my life whose kids are a few years beyond mine. Yeah. And yeah. I actually take, I wanted to, I don't know if you have ever mentioned this to you. I take great joy and comfort in watching your career because I see what's possible for me in about six years. And I yeah. see what's possible with another friend of mine, Mike Royce, who is a TV writer. Uh, his kids are exactly 10 years older than me. And I see what's mm -hmm. possible when my kids, both kids are 10 years older. And it's yeah. amazing how slowly, incrementally, in maybe small ways that you and Mike have not noticed, you've gotten your time back as they become teenagers yeah. and then 20 somethings. Oh, yeah. And uh, I'm, I, I'm not jealous. I'm what's the word optimistic and enthusiastic Hopeful. about, yeah. Re yeah, about reclaiming a little bit of that time as, yeah. cause that will, that will also uh, um, be a, a small payment for the loss of like my teenagers wanting to hang out with me less. You know what I mean? Like it's, yeah. there's also yeah. the sadness of that, but it's a, you also get more career time back, which is nice. So there's, yeah, there's I mean, I, I, let me tell you the, for the first time in their lives, last week, they had a, both of them had a dentist appointment and we said, all right, go to the dentist. Let us know how it turns out when you get back. What? You know? Whoa, we, that it, blows my mind. Yeah. Yeah. They, it, it, and they walked because you know, it was in the, it, it was in the city. We live, uh, it was maybe a 25 minute walk. They walked down there. We gave them each 20 bucks so they could get something for takeout, you know, on their way back uh, if they wanted to stop someplace. Uh, but uh, obviously we're like, can't go in, <laughs> but you can get takeout and get the hell out. Uh, made it a thing, you know, have a good time. Enjoy being out and about. Uh, let us know if we got any cavities we got to worry about on the way back. <laughs> <laughs> you know? and, and it was, it was great. I didn't have to take them. I didn't have to sit in that waiting room. I didn't have to do any of that. We just said, goodbye. Goodbye. See you later. Get the hell out. Can I, can I contrast that with what I had to do yesterday, which was, <laughs> yes! I, this is, you're going to laugh at this contrast. So you're like, okay, you're going to the dentist all by yourself. Here's 20 bucks. Also, I need you to make this payment to the dentist. So there you go. Here's another check for you. Uh, yeah. 
In contrast, Dave Kellett was like, no, you absolutely cannot have this 20 foot long bamboo stick in the living room. Put that back in the backyard. Get get that out of the house. You're going to break every glass thing in this living room. Put that bamboo gonna, stick outside. You're going to turn the living room into an Abbott and Costello sketch. <laughs> <laughs> what? This bamboo stick? Wonk. I don't even have bamboo in my yard. My My neighbor has. Where do they get a bamboo? So bamboo is one of those plants where it like shoots the, the root like 20 feet out and then sprouts back <gasps> up again. And it's really? also incredibly fast growing. Like if it's the yeah. wet season, you can actually hear bamboo growing. It like cracks and grows so fast, right? Wow. So my damn neighbor, and I get why, because his yard's very different. He has a very tropical backyard, but the shoots come over to my yard. And so suddenly right in the middle of my avocado tree, there'll be a bamboo shoot coming up. And I'm like, well, how did that get here? Where did that come from? And so I chop them down and my little one loves them because they're like the best stick ever. They're yeah. they're they're a great whacking stick. They have the, the tensile yes. strength that you want, the weight that you want, like the weight to hit ratio is amazing. It's a, it's a great stick for a kid. It's like a little whip. Yeah. yeah. But I hadn't chopped it up yet for him. So it's this 20 foot long stick. And he's like, I'm bringing it inside. And I'm like, no, you're not. No, you're not. <laughs> anyway, what a great comic lab. I'm so glad that we got onto that topic. What a fun, what a fun and useful bo- uh, thing for everybody on that one. That was great. Hey, if you're listening while you work, take a minute to stand and stretch. And while you're doing that, we're going to tell you why you should join us on Patreon. When you do, you're going to get hours and hours of podcasts that we've recorded just for backers. And exclusive Patreon posts that go even deeper on Comic Lab topics. And access to our exclusive Discord server, which is a thriving community of professional cartoonists. So you can support the show you love and get tons of actionable resources for your own cartooning. And listen, if you can't swing a pledge this month, we get it. No worries. Yeah, yeah, listen, you can still support the show by rating us wherever you get your podcasts. Just leave a five-star review and a few kind words. That, along with mentions on social media, is incredibly helpful. Now, everybody, let's talk comics. So, Dave, now that we've uh, uh, wowed our audience with our proficiency in baseball, uh, let's get to a few $5 Patreon questions. And I've got one that I really want to hear your answer on. This one comes from Raj Solanke, who says, you often talk about keeping your head in a swivel and having multiple legs under your table. Over all of your years in the business, what are some of the most random forms of income you've had? Ooh, Raj, that is a good question. Boy, what a perfect feed-in from that last topic, too. Because, yeah, uh, yeah Raj, so for, for people that don't uh, remember, Brad and I often advocate for uh, a many legs under the table uh, philosophy of your career. The table, in this case, being metaphorically your career. The right. legs, in this case, being different, as, as varied and different forms of income as you can underneath the table, propping it up. So uh, especially on a year like the one that I had last year, I am very glad that I had uh, Patreon, original art sales, direct book sales, Amazon uh, sales to prop up the fact that one leg under that table, i.e. Comic Cons, completely got pulled away, couldn't go to Emerald City, couldn't go to San Diego, couldn't go to Anaheim. And so uh, that having been removed, how great that I had those other forms of income to keep the company and Beth and my uh, careers going, right? And then Brad, the other idea is keeping your head on a swivel, right? Do you want to just give everybody a quick update on what that one is? Well, yeah, that's, that's, you always want to kind of keep aware of the new things as they're coming down the pike and at least not necessarily jumping on them, but just being aware of them so that you can learn what there is to know uh, so you can make a, a good decision. Yeah. And so with those, I just wanted to give everybody a recap of those two. So now to Raj's question, uh, having kept our heads on a swivel and trying to put as many legs under our table as possible, what are some of the most random forms of income we've had? And I'll tell you, Raj, the, the ones that are the weirdest are the companies that have way too much money for their own good, i.e. <laughs> software companies or gaming companies. That will come to me and be, and honestly, this is how the emails normally go. I'm like, uh, hey, would you draw this? And I'm like, no, that's not really what I draw, but thank you for thinking yeah. of me. Here's a better artist uh, that might be more willing to do it. Well, what yep. if we paid you this ridiculous sum? Yes, I'm happy to draw that. That sounds like something <laughs> that's right up my alley. I think that I would love to draw that. I mean, have you ever had something like that, Brad, where 
some company, either local, regional, or international, will reach out to you and be like, hey, can you draw this thing? And you're like, no, it's not really my style. I don't really draw that no, kind of stuff. That is what never if we happened. backed up? What if we backed up this money truck? Beep, beep, <laughs> beep. And you're like, yeah, I can draw that. <laughs> No, I, for some reason, I don't get a lot of the, the corporate gigs uh, that you're talking about. Uh, that is, that is bl- uh, not happened. I'm not sure what I would do. I'd, I'd be very tempted to, to take the job, uh, hire that artist you're talking about, <laughs> you know, subcontract right. them and, and take a, a, a percentage and go on with it. <laughs> you, uh, how do you handle something like that? Oh, how I handle it is I flip the check over and I write my name on the back and then I deposit it into the, that's how I handle it. (laughs) That's a smart way to handle it. It's a very smart way to handle it. Uh, No, there's been some things where like things that are just not my wheelhouse. And and this doesn't happen often, Raj, by the way, but you asked what are the weirdest. Like once every five years, I'll get one of these weird corporate requests. Like, hi, we're, I don't know, such and such and such a company and we're, we're doing And it's not even for something big. This is what I mean when they have so much money that they it's like for some corporate retreat event. Like it's not even for like communications. Right. It's or marketing. It's like some internal thing like, hey, we're having a new policy where everybody at the company has to log in by 8 a.m. with their data from the day before. Can you make a little character? I'm like, well, I don't really do corporate. Oh, for that check. Yes, I sure can. Yeah. Here we go. You know. Um, but how about you, Brad? What are the weirdest forms of income that uh, you've gotten uh, or random? I guess not weirdest, random. So I guess I don't have a really good answer for this question because it, it, basically mine are all kind of what I would consider standard, right? You've got uh, books, uh, uh, direct uh, books direct to your customer, books into distribution, eBooks on a couple of different platforms, obviously crowdfunding. Uh, advertising I've long since uh, gotten rid of, so there's not that. Uh, and 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 after that, original art sales, kind of, but that's really more through Patreon these days. Uh, uh, I I I really I, I like to have a number of passive income uh, uh, opportunities set up, like eBooks and stuff like that, and and distribution through Amazon. But uh, I don't have that many. And I guess that's kind of the, the point I want to make with this question, uh, because I see Raj's uh, question says, well, what are the most random things? And I, I feel like we might need a little course correction there when we talk about the legs under the table, because the object isn't to get as many legs under the table as possible. In fact, that's that's really not the object. It's not about quantity. It's about quality. You want uh, you want many good legs under the table. In other words, it's not about becoming a snipe, uh, not about uh, uh, becoming a, a scatter shot. You know, like using buckshot and mm-hmm. and you shoot the gun and all these pellets go all over and you hope that some of them hit. We're not talking about doing a scatter shot thing. Uh, we're talking about making good choices and 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 getting many legs. But it's not about getting every random thing that you could possibly get. If that were the case, we would have advised you a couple of weeks ago to jump in with NFTs and Uh, be very, (laughs) you need to, uh, this is an important point I want to make. We said, don't get involved with NFTs. This is not a great thing for any number of reasons. We talked about uh, the, uh, a lot of the reasons, including the uh, the environmental reasons uh, that we uh, lined up on the Pro Tips episode that uh, went out along with that. But uh, and and just this week, uh, uh, you saw the NFTs evidently had a big crash. Uh, you know, there was a big bottoming out of everything. Larda Sousa, uh, uh, who's a wonderful uh, artist, had the perfect take on it. He says, listen, I, I, you, I, I'm seeing that the NFT market had a big crash this week. But listen, if you still want to pay huge amounts of money for digital art, just go to the artist directly and buy digital art for large amounts of money. You can still do it. And if you don't want to do that, he said, then it was never about the art. Yeah. Yeah. True. <laughs> True. That one little tweet summed up everything that I thought about uh, with NFTs. So no, this isn't about quantity. This isn't about getting lots and lots of things or else we would tell you to jump on every boat that comes down the stream. Right, right. <laughs> Instead, we're saying, we're saying yes, passive income, absolutely. Like uh, eBooks and stuff like that, that, the more you accumulate, the more that passive income uh, builds. 
but we're not talking about amassing a huge number of random income streams. <laughs> right. Or, because, you know what I mean? Yeah. Okay. If I could just build off of that, because uh, yeah. also w w when you have too many income streams, which are small to middling, and I have a yeah. few that are like this and they end up, what they end up doing is annoying you more than bringing you income. And right. for, I'll give you an example. So Stripped, which I mentioned at the top of the show, I, I many years ago, I made a film called Stripped. We had DVDs and Blu-rays that for, are for sale. There's a company yeah. called Midwest Tapes that, that uh, um, what do you call it? Uh, uh, distributes those film, those tapes, or the DVDs, sorry around mm -hmm. the country, right? Well, the problem is Midwest Tapes is a 40-year-old business model, and they probably yeah. have computers running Windows 95. So the invoicing <laughs> process, Brad, is they send me a, a, a purchase order. I have to confirm in writing the purchase order. I then have to send yeah. the product. I then have to send the invoice. All of this, oh. by the way, when the unit per the per unit cost of selling them a DVD is like seven bucks, right? It's not a lot. Yeah. And so I yeah. end up being more annoyed and time wasted. And that's the exact kind of thing that Brad's talking about. Like yeah. my return on investment for those at this point, I'm, al I'm almost at the point of being like, look, I'm not going to uh, uh, fulfill this anymore. I I think we're done. Thanks very much for a good five years and, and we'll part ways here. Because frankly, like Brad said, there are some income streams where it's not worth it to have a thousand of them. If all of yeah. them take you 20 minutes here, 20 minutes there and bring in five dollars, it's not worth it. However, there are nice bits of passive income. And this is another weird one, Raj, um, where a comic that I will have drawn 10 years ago, 15 years ago, suddenly I and I can see how this happens. Suddenly a professor who has had that comic pinned on their wall or their front door <laughs> yeah. and in their school office building for the last 10 years is writing a book about that topic. And yeah. then they will go to their publisher and they'll say, hey, we'd like to license that comic from you, Dave. Boy, yeah. that is the lowest of low hanging fruit. I always yeah. say you, you have it. Uh, you have all rights, global, digital and print. For the first mm -hmm. use, if you ever reissue or revise this book, we have to redo the licensing. And boy, that yeah. income just pays for itself because for the textbooks that do revise, and there are some that I've sold to that have been gone through four or five, it's it's cha-ching, cha-ching, cha-ching every time because it's so much easier for them just to issue the check once than yep. to have to have to, you know, argue over numbers. You know, they're just like, let's just get this done. Yeah. And and, and I, I want to make sure I'm, I'm clear about this because I'm not saying that that's where Raj was coming from necessarily. Right. But when I saw that word random in there, it, it, it brought up the fact that I want I've been wanting to talk about that for a while, because sometimes when we talk about these broad topics, sometimes we need to do a little course correction. <laughs> right. And when I saw random, I'm like, nah, I want to talk about the uh, this just for a second. So that, that's why I brought it up. Uh, Raj could have just been looking to bring up a completely fun topic and and I don't want to besmirch the poor guy. Well, can I can I Brad on your can I speak on your behalf? Because I don't think yeah. this gets mentioned enough is uh, Raj specifically framed it as random forms of income you've had. And I think you have one of the best examples of a perfect random form of income, which is okay. you, Brad, create Evil Link. You then create an Evil Link uh, not suitable for work that's, that is largely fed uh, by a, uh, a, a Patreon paywall kind of a thing, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. People are paying for all these extras. One of the levels is to get a commission, which is amazing. They pay a lot of money. They get great work from you, right? You then take yep. that commission, put it back into <laughs> Patreon, put it back into books, right? I yep. mean, it's, it's this perfect circle of... Uh, seemingly a random income, but it's not at all. You've engineered this to be a, a virtuous circle of created yeah. art that pays for itself again and again and again in a perfect loop. And it's great. I, I've, I've set up this whole system where I get more content for my Patreon, which brings me more Patreon backers, uh, all because some of those backers became backers at a higher level so that they would give me more content so that I could have more content right. on my Patreon. It just, it's, it's, uh, you know what? It's second only to uh, I, a, a podcast that would have uh, Patreon backers send questions into the show. So the hosts would have something to talk about. <laughs> <laughs> oh, whoa. What a, what a great physician heal thyself moment that was, yeah, Brad. I yeah, don't know of a podcast yeah. that's like that. Uh, well, let me ask you. So because uh, to, I, the reason I mentioned that that's random, quote unquote, yeah. is like, had you brought that business model to a cartoonist in 1975 in a oh, syndicate model, yeah. they would have yeah. been like, what? This is will that work that people would people would do that? And yes, yeah. that absolutely is. A, it's it's not the main part, but it is a massive cornerstone of Brad's business. And it's brilliant. Yeah, uh, but it's totally random from what used to exist 40 years ago. So anyway. Absolutely. I just want to bring that out, A, to sing your praises, but B, also that the seemingly random can become a cornerstone if you do it right. 
That's a great point. And and actually, this next question I've got for you, Dave, uh, dovetails nicely into a, a theme that seems to be developing. Uh, this comes in from uh, Dave Ketcherside, who says, first of all, thank you for being here and being such delightful source of information for me. Yours is one of the few podcasts I watch for every week. So hey, thank you, David. Thank you, David. I want to know what makes you decide when to join or use a social media platform. I've seen some presence from you on TikTok, but it looks like you have given that up quickly. For me, I've had some success on Instagram, but I have found much wider reach on TikTok. How long do you stay with the platform when you do start a new one? And what upcoming platforms are you looking at now? So Dave, Along with that same idea where it's not necessarily quantity, it's quality, uh, uh, new platforms come up all the time. There's all a the time. bunch we can talk about right now, uh, including TikTok. You've got uh, Pillow Fort, and I think Mammoth is another one. Uh, uh, Clubhouse is another yep, one. Yep. Club. Oh, yeah. We just talked about Clubhouse a few weeks ago. How do we decide... Uh, especially if we sign up and try it for a little bit, uh, like I did with TikTok, I don't think you were ever on TikTok. You l looked at that and said, nah, not for me. Yeah. But uh, I tried it for a little bit, which I'll talk about in a minute. Uh, but how do you decide on a platform like that? Uh, I, I, whether you're going to put a bunch of steam behind it or, or just ditch. Well, before we go on, I did not know that you tried TikTok and I'm desperate to know, were you doing like thirst trap content where you're dancing to Beyonce? What were you doing, Brad? Oh I, yeah. I'd stand, I'd stand in the doorway and play, put your head on my shoulder and the red light would come up. I, I did all <laughs> that stuff. <laughs> uh, so, okay. This is a great question. And uh, uh, you kind of uh, intimated in the question itself, David, uh, the, some of the considerations that we're looking for, which is yeah. Staying power of the social media platform itself, because some of them are super fly by night and you can kind of tell that you're like, ah, this one's going to live for about six months and like a cicada, mm -hmm. we'll go back into the earth. Uh, <laughs> and then there's other ones where you're like, even if this one does well, even if it if, even if it uh, performs its goals as a social media platform, it doesn't serve me well. Right. It doesn't mm -hmm. it either doesn't link out to the things that I want to link out to when I post something. Or the audience uh, is not um, coming to this platform for my kind of content, right? Yeah. And so that's those are the kind of three considerations that I uh, use in evaluating is the staying power of the platform, my usability of the platform in order to link to the things that make it possible for me to keep creating, right? Yeah. And then the overall communities aspect and, and um, appreciation for comics on that platform. So for me, with TikTok... Uh, and in, in in many respects with Instagram, um, uh, my recognition is that a lot of people don't necessarily go there for ideas, if that makes sense. Yeah. They yeah. go there for temporary mindlessness and mm -hmm. uh, the little oblivion that is entertainment. You know what I mean? That kind of like scrolling yes. and mindless. You know, you have 10 minutes before a doctor's appointment or you can't fall asleep. So you're just kind of scrolling endlessly. That is a little bit to me what TikTok and Instagram are for a lot yes. of people. Not not everyone. Um, to me, Twitter feels much more like a platform of ideas. Not all of them are mm -hmm. good, but it feels like that's where people go for uh, idea based content, you know, whether it is, yeah. uh, a text written or image driven, um, that's where ideas seem to more. And Brad, what are your thoughts about that? So your first blush well, will glance at a social media platform. Same thing that, that you said, uh, first of all, when, when, when Dave, Dave says he, that he, uh, he's getting engagement on, on TikTok, the first question I've got is passive engagement or active engagement. Are, are you getting people that looked at your video that's passive engagement, and it's fine. It's the building block. Active engagement is, did they click on a link and go to your Patreon? Did they click on a link and go to your Kickstarter or to your mm -hmm. website? Mm -hmm. That's the engagement that I'm looking for is active engagement. It's got a lot more value for me. Uh, so when I went to TikTok, uh, I, I, I sized that up very quickly. And that it was exactly for that kind of content Dave was talking about. And the kind of talk content that a lot of, uh, of which was that content that he kind of joked about at the top of the topic, which was thirst trap content. And what happened, I did the same thing and I do it on Instagram reels too. I just go through and scroll mindlessly through the content, right? right. <laughs> you know, and, and not only that, but like, it's got a lot of that thirst trap content. And then 
for my algorithm somehow has decided that I love fishing videos. I'll get videos of people <laughs> fishing. I don't understand how that works, but the algorithm, by the way, they're fascinating videos, <laughs> but, but how it knew I wanted to watch fishing videos. I have no idea. That's amazing because there's, if there's one guy that I can imagine likes less putting a worm on a hook, it's Brad Geiger. <laughs> who's, I personally hate putting a worm on a hook. I'm oh. always like, I'm so sorry, little guy. Uh, Cause they anyway, always recoil, you know, yeah. you're hurting you, them. And I they're just doing the writhing and you're like, ah, oh, you're a living yeah. creature. Uh, yeah. what the two algorithms that I've gotten that have blown my mind on Instagram, suddenly I get a lot of dinosaur content and, and, um, <laughs> And all I tell you what, I don't hate it. I'm always learning about yeah. new dinosaurs. I'm like, I didn't know this one existed. All right, this is cool. Yeah. So I don't hate that one. But the other one that I take real offense at, Brad, is I'm getting a lot of t-shirt ads for dad bod t-shirts. And I'm like, I don't appreciate this. I don't appreciate Boy, that those the algorithms, algorithms are good, aren't they? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you can fuck but, right off. So, uh, the, so here's what I'm going to say to you about these social media platforms. First, I'm going to uh, I'm going to be a bit of a hypocrite. So, so buckle up. You've never heard this from me. A little bit of hypocrisy. When one of those new platforms comes down, the guy who just told you not to be a, a shotgun shooter and to be a sniper instead, that guy is going to tell you sign up for him anyway, r- right away, because I want to secure my name just in case it does become something big. And then I don't want to be Brad Geiger, 341 Philly guy. You know, I want, I want Geiger or I want evil link. You know, I want something that's branded to me. So I'll sign up. I won't use them right away. I'll kind of look around a little bit, but like when pillow fort, I came out, I think I've got uh, a pillow fort. I I had a mammoth, uh, you know, I, I, I sign up for a lot of these don't necessarily use them. Now, when I got out on TikTok, I could tell right away this was not going to be where people were going to be looking for my kind of content, right? right this right. is for something very, very different and very, very much video mo- motion graphic type of stuff that uh, that I wasn't necessarily going to put a lot of energy behind. And here's the other thing that happened. We've been living in a social media internet for te- uh, well over 10 years now. We kind of, at this point, we can see the patterns. Here's what happened to me on TikTok and why I left almost immediately. The first few things that I put up, I did put up kind of motion graphic-y stuff. You can do that with your comic easily enough and and kind of animated a walkthrough of my comic strip. And the first two or three I put up got monster engagement. Monster, like I, I remember texting Dave. I said, hey, you know, this looks pretty promising, blah, blah. And then of the, the the more I posted, oh, but by the way, those were the exact words you used to me. Uh, you 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 had emailed me and you go, "This looks pretty promising." Blah blah, and I was like, "What does that mean as a text?" That's an <laughs> odd text so to t- get. I get so tired of texting words. It's like you know what? <laughs> we've been friends for twenty years. You know what I'm gonna say? Just fill it in and text me back. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I, I so but then all of a sudden the bottom dropped out and I wasn't getting engagement and I'm like. You sons of bitches, you're going to make me chase that high of those original posts that were really high. You're going to get me into a gambler situation where Mm -hmm. I keep, same as a comic convention, keep coming back time after time and then tell myself, well, this one did a little bit better. Maybe, you know, I was standing in the right position when I put this one up and that one didn't do so good, but that's okay. Tomorrow's going to be better. You're going to have me gambling with this uh, algorithm uh, and trying to chase the high of those first ones. And I took a look at that and the fact that the content was just not the kind of content that was going to be supportive of my thing. And I said, nope, I'm out. I'm done. No mas. Yeah. (laughs) Right. And I made that decision and it especially pissed me off when I saw that they throttled my engagement with the algorithm very, very quickly. I'm like, nah, if I, if I wanted to get frustrated, I've got Instagram for that. <laughs> I don't need Tic Tac, uh, Tic Tac, Tic Tac, whatever. Tic-tac! <laughs> but, so here's the other thing. We've got lots of platforms, right? And Twitter, mm-hmm. I still think uh, with all of its problems is probably the best. Uh, but you've got lots of, lots of uh, choices. Just recently, Dave, one came up called Please Me. Right. And it was specifically for adult content creators. Well, this sounds great. I figured I, I definitely want to keep a, uh, an eye on what's going on for that. 
Well, it, it, it's it, it's one of those things that on paper is perfect. You you really want this thing, a social media just for adult content creators. Fantastic. The engagement is null. There's no engagement. <laughs> there's there's zero engagement. And I'm and I so I tried it for a few times. Put some stuff up. Was was active there. Even kind of. I, I, I told my Patreon backers about it. Hey, this is something you might want to be enjoy. Uh, you you might be uh, interested in. And uh, there's there was no engagement. And the thing about it is, is that we've got so many choices for established social media. So many choices for things where you you know what you've got going. The idea of building another social media or another platform just isn't uh, it isn't uh, feasible. I, I don't have that much time <laughs> and I don't need to. So uh, how do we make that decision? We make it very closely. Is there active engagement uh, it, it, to the point that I can see it happening all the time? Great. Are they playing games with me like TikTok seem to be doing? Nah, I got other things to do. Yeah, yeah. I So very similar to that is, is kind of my relationship with Facebook and Instagram. Uh, Facebook, yeah. I have backed out completely. I, I basically turned yeah. everything off and left that because I just – um, from from a moral and business standpoint, I, there was a couple of triggering events that I was just like, I just do not like the way that Facebook is handling everything. You know, vaguely, this is me waving at the right. world. I don't like the way they're handling a lot of things. And then with yeah. Instagram, even after they bought that out, um, I was like, you know, I'm a little more willing to give this uh, some some a chance because it seems to be a little bit more amenable to a cartoonist, even though it's owned by Facebook. And so having tried it, though, I will be honest to this day. Uh, my audience, quote unquote, on Instagram is, I, I don't, can't do the math in my head real quick, somewhere between eight and 10 times bigger than my audience on Twitter. Twitter mm -hmm. still vastly overperforms on what I yes. put on there to the linkable um, uh, results of people coming to my Kickstarter or my Patreon or my website or wherever I need to point mm -hmm. them. Whereas Instagram, it's it's like trying to, to move a ship in the Suez. It's just, you got all these barges <laughs> and you're trying to push it and nothing's happening. And so like, I see, Brad, I know I keep coming back to this, but I see cartoonist peers of ours who have put hundreds of thousands and millions of up on the board. And I hope for them that they are yes. able to capitalize on one to 10 percent of that audience and bring yep. them to Patreon. Yep. Like I see Adam Ellis doing great on Patreon. It makes me so happy. But yes. what if Adam could actually reach his millions of followers daily without having to pay for it? I want yeah. that to exist as a social media platform. So my continuing hope is in the same way that DuckDuckGo as a, as a um, browser looked at, or not, as a search engine, looked at Google mm -hmm. and said, we can do this better with more privacy and less tracking, right? We can give you what Google does and do it better. Uh, yeah. My hope is that someone someday will come along with Instagram and say, look at Instagram was and could be a great platform. We just got to yeah. remove some of this bullshit in terms of throttling uh, of creators and their in direct interaction with their audience. And then it would be mm -hmm. great because I want those cartoonists that have 2.4 million followers to be able to reach all 2.4 without having to pay for it yeah. or only be able to reach one to 10 percent of their audience on a given post. You know, that's bullshit. That's straight up bullshit. No, you're absolutely right. You're absolutely right. So when it comes to uh, the, the question at hand, how do we take a look at new ones? Uh, the fact of the matter is, is you can size those up very, very quickly, uh, yeah. or at least I can. It's either there's either something there or there's not. I would just encourage you uh, to not get distracted by the shiny object. Remember what yeah. I told you about active engagement versus passive engagement. The one you want to be impressed by is active engagement. Are you able to send those people where you need them? If all you're getting is, is views, that's that's not that's not much to write home about. Yeah, and I will. I I'll put maybe a capstone on this, which is Brad <clears throat> wisely said, "Park your name," which I think is always good advice. There's no harm in parking your name. You know, it's one more yep. email that's in one more database. It's not that big a deal. Um, so park your name, and then I would actually advise. This is one of those situations in life where you don't want to be the first mover. It it doesn't gain you to yeah. be the first one to go big on Mammoth or Pillow Fort or Clubhouse or whatever it is. It actually behooves you to wait it out six months to a year and go, hey, I see mm -hmm. five or six other cartoonists that I respect are actually starting to make some progress on that. And I see what they're doing and I like the way that that platform works for them. Now I will jump in. 
You know, it's yeah. like uh, you don't want to be the first person to, to jump in on a brand new computer model or a brand new electric car that no uh, one's uh, tried out. Uh, Let some other people yeah. buy that first and see how it goes. Let some and, other people make that uh, headway for you. Yeah, yeah. So I think that's a good enough capstone on it is don't uh, this is one where you don't want to be a first mover. Absolutely. Now, Dave, I'm I'm actually sensing a theme here, uh, and I'm going to throw one more question at you real quick. All right. Uh, this comes in from Mark Ashworth, who says, how are your comics coming along to submit to the Eisners? Oh, Mark. So, OK, uh, I, I will answer this question about submitting to the Eisners. But I think what Mark is asking about is when you and I were talking about The New Yorker, right? Isn't yeah. don't you think I that's think what I, I looked at that, too, and I'm like, I don't think he knows what I, I, I think there's a disconnect there. We submit our comics to the Eisners every year. I, I don't know that that's a big thing, but we did talk about on the show that we were going to uh, we kind of uh, in the moment as the show was going on, we said, oh, my gosh, that would be really fun. It would to collaborate on comics to submit to the New Yorker magazine and to see if we could get picked up uh, by doing that. Uh, and so I, I think that's the question we're, we should answer is how, how are our New Yorker subscriptions or uh, uh, submissions going? Right. Every year, Mark, we do submit to the Eisner. So just to clarify on that one, we do yeah. submit and we, and we recommend that every pro submit to the Eisner. Yeah. Because what will happen is as a web cartoonist, you'll submit to the Eisner's, your work will be good. You'll get a nomination for the Eisner's. And then you'll never, ever get voted because we're not in the mass market and people <laughs> right. that don't come up with shops don't know who you are. So that's exactly. what will happen. And that's OK. Yeah. That's the once you accept that, Mark. That's <laughs> that's, that's listen, that's what, listen, that's perfectly fine. You know, it's, fine. it's a real honor just just to get nominated. <laughs> you know, I, I, I love to get nominated for I do, and I do wonder, though, how uh, because, uh, Brad, we're still losing a couple hundred comic book shops a year in the U.S. Yeah. I wonder what the future of the Eisners will be as, I mean, I know that uh, DC and Marvel are both making new, basically, distribution deals to work around Diamond. So uh, yeah. there may yet be some life in the comic book shop. I don't think a lot, but there may still be some life there. But it will be interesting to see what the Eisners look like five years from now, 10 years from now. Anyway, to your central point, though, Brad, about The New Yorker, um, yeah. I'll give I'll give the recap and then Brad can can say where we netted out on this. So on yeah. one of our pro tips or comic lab shows, we talked about, hey, wouldn't it be fun is sort of our bucket list if we got into the New Yorker. We've we've managed great careers. Wouldn't it be fun, Brad, if we teamed up together, we would write together and trade off on drawing or maybe even draw together a New Yorker submission set and keep doing that for a couple of months until we got in. And then once we got in, we'd say, hooray, I really enjoy that $800 check. Uh, let's let's be done with it. Right. Yeah. And then, um, Brad, why don't you tell people what happened next then after, oh, after we proposed yeah. that idea? So so then came the next step. And the next step is we're not going to do that. <laughs> <laughs> and the next and the reason for that is is that we were in the moment on the show and and this is worth talking about we, we you heard two guys kind of brainstorming and, and enjoying each other's creativity and saying yeah that would be a lot of fun to do we turned the microphones off and the following week i said do you really want to do this and he goes no i don't want to do this at all uh, it's a lot of work for not much uh, return, there's no ROI. I've got other things that I I, I sh need to be doing for my own business that I'm going to be taking time away from. Right. Uh, and I said, yeah, I I feel exactly the same way. This is a a lot of work for not much return. Uh, I don't want to do it either. So yeah, we're not doing it. <laughs> and and it's important to understand that kind of decision making process. If we if we followed every shiny object that came down the road and and did this stuff we would not be full-time cartoonists for very long we'd be out there looking for a day job very quickly uh, because that's how you put yourself out of business you lose right. focus of what you're supposed to be doing and you <laughs> and you get uh, distracted by projects like this and distracted by a shiny object is the perfect metaphor because on this show yeah. over the course of the last three years, you have heard Brad and I pitch and talk at length about entire projects that we could do 
whether yep. it's things from the time traveling superhero to the to the uh the the kaiju cowboy comic to this oh, new yorker yeah. project uh yeah. the new yorker project that we were talked about uh all of which just to be clear would be super fun brad and i would have yes. so much fun writing that new yorker project we'd have so much Doubtless. fun drawing it it would be fun to submit it and to share them publicly but then the the roi would be terrible because like brad said yes. we would be stepping away from active thousands that we would be making from our own work to make eight hundred dollars right. for the new and by the way i might and be then, wrong and then check split it. that yeah split yes. that check between the two of us now it's four hundred dollars and right. it's and it's a, a bunch of time uh that you could make i, I mean let's face it four hundred dollars we could make that up in a couple of original art sales maybe yeah. an art auction yeah you know Drawing that, the stuff that i truly want to draw that money you know? that could be passive income and and while you're working on this You've got your eye off the ball. That means I'm not doing evil ink or after dark. It means he's not doing Sheldon and drive. Uh, uh, <laughs> and it's, and it's completely distracting. So yeah, that, it, and it's a little unfair because we talked about it live during the show. Oh yeah, we're going to do this. Uh, and then we're not going to do it. But uh, the reason for that is, is that I, I don't, that that would be a really dumb decision. Yeah. Wait, so basically what you're seeing in real time there is uh, two friends and two business partners uh, discussing and determining in real time that the genuine ROI in terms of time investment, the risk yeah. management in terms of missed uh, opportunities with our existing properties that are make existing money already, and in general, the, the possibility that we could work conceivably for six to 12 months and not even please the editor for oh. The New Yorker, even though I heard she's lovely, the new editor. Uh, yeah. and, you know, she just might not take a shine to whatever we're producing and we might not right. even get one in. And then I, I might be a little bit off with the $800 number. I think it's still somewhere around there. Let's say it's a thousand. Who cares? Uh, we sell it yeah. for a thousand. Well, whoop de doo We just generated dozens and dozens of comics to, to make 500 bucks. Well, great. Well, good for us and I'm on gonna... that stupid business decision. I'm going to play the podcast listener who says, but, but wait, you could share that to your Patreon backers, those comics. Yeah, I could, but here's the deal. My Patreon back, and I do share bonus cartoons that are very much like uh, cartoons that I would put up for the New Yorker from time to time. I absolutely do that, but that's not why my Patreon backers are Patreon backers. They're there for uh, uh, for a certain uh, uh, evil link content that I'm putting out there, those bonuses are just bonuses, and I can I can do those bonuses anytime I want. You know, it, it, it's it's an important distinction about keeping your focus, keeping uh, uh, keeping your focus on what you're supposed to be doing. Yes, we could take those submitted cartoons uh, that were rejected, and we could put them up on Patreon, and we could have some content. You're you're absolutely right, but at the end of the day. Our time is spent uh, doing the things that our backers and our readers uh, arrive for. And that's Sheldon Drive, Evil Link, After Dark, According Disaster. That's what they're there for. Exactly. And um, there might be also be some, uh, let's put ourselves in this podcast listeners saying, yeah, but Brad and Dave, you could also be in the New Yorker. Yes, we could. Ugh. We could absolutely be in the New Yorker. But part of that, uh, and, and just acknowledge this for all of our hearts, all of that is a sort of egotistical nostalgia factor that remembers what the New Yorker was in terms of our own life importance as, as cartoonists 20 years ago, 30 years ago, right? Yep. Whereas yep. right now, because I have talked to them and we can have them on the show, all the New Yorker cartoonists that I know are like, so tell me about this webcomic stuff. How do you make this work? Because I got to tell you, this ain't working for me anymore. I generate 40 comics a week for the New Yorker and I sell two and I got to make a better living. Am I wrong, yeah. Brad? We've had this conversation no, with New Yorker not. cartoonists. You are not. And, 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 it, and it's my own. It, it, I, I'm the same way. It would be so nice to have. Uh, all those people who just who still don't understand what I do for a living as right. an uh, as an independent cartoonist who's publishing digitally, they just don't get it. Seeing my name in the New Yorker, if they saw it, because you know they're not regular people aren't like you and me, Dave. Uh, as soon as I read I read the comic, I look at the signature to see who it is. Normal people don't do that, so they could see my comic in the New Yorker and never know it was me, right? I'd have right. to go up and point to it. Hey, you look at this, look at this, and those compliments aren't nearly as fun. But let's say somebody <laughs> actually did realize that I had something in the New Yorker, and I get that kind of uh, acknowledgement finally that I've been thirsting for, right? I get that kind of acknowledgement. Uh, the next month, they're going to say, "Hey." 
I didn't see you in the New Yorker this week. <laughs> and I got to now deal with those assholes. So, yeah. And so, so no, it's, that's a no win game. I'll just take my career and, and shuffle off to the corner. And that's why this, uh, we are accidentally coming upon a theme in the show, which is yeah. uh, taking steps, which are benefit the marathon, not the sprint and yes. trying, spending time trying to get into the New Yorker is if we're honest about it, mainly an egotistical move and also yes. is a, is a, an attempt of the sprint, not the marathon. So let's say, Brad, you and I have worked for six months and hooray, she buys one of our comics and it's in the New Yorker. Yeah. Hooray, we get all these nice words on social media. Oh my God, yep. Brad and Dave, you did it. Congratulations. You're on the That's so Guess cool. What? Next week, it doesn't change a damn thing about a career. Not a damn no. thing. We're back to exactly where we were. So it's exactly like winning an Eisner. Would we like it? Absolutely. <laughs> Would it be yes. fun for our ego? You have no idea how much it would be fun for mm -hmm. our ego. Would it make a damn lick of business the next week uh, in our comic career? No. So the marathon doesn't benefit at all from it. The sprint does, right. but the marathon does. And so um, that's part of the risk management and the decision making that went into this. Yeah. Yeah. It was it was all about those things that we say all the time. Return on investment, keeping your focus. Uh, and 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 it's weird. And I, I hear us talking and it's like, you are the same guys who set head on a swivel and, and, and lots sure. of legs under the sure. table. And, and the fact of the matter is all of those things are true. Right. <laughs> all of those things are true. You've got to use your judgment and, and, and using good judgment uh, is, is something that's incredibly important. I could give you lists and lists of people who are at the top of their game, not only in comics, but in publishing and illustration and all kinds of other things that, that got uh, distracted by different passions that, that were outside of their purview and got completely thrown and are either in a couple cases completely disappeared, or in some cases are still trying to fight their way back. Mm -hmm. It's an important, uh, it's an important thing to do. I wish I could tell you how to do it other than you just got to really be paying attention and make good decisions. Uh, but yeah, it, 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 the fact of the matter is, uh, many legs under the table is just as important as return on investment. And you've yeah. got to learn where the line is between those two things. Right. And and uh, I think to say it slightly differently about what Brad was just saying about keeping our head on a swivel, we are keeping our head on a swivel by every once in a while. Absolutely. We will talk to New Yorker cartoonists, evaluate how things are going at the New Yorker, mm -hmm. evaluate how things are going at, I don't know, this or that magazine. And then we go, all right, good, noted. I'm swiveling away from that, right? Like you <laughs> swivel to check in, right? I'm, I'm, yeah. I'm being honest here. You yes, and I, every yes. once in a while, we'll talk to somebody from Marvel or DC and be like, how are the page rates? Okay, I'm swiveling away. How are the page yeah. rates at New Yorker? Okay, I'm swiveling back to my web comics because yeah. we, we basically are constantly doing an evaluation of return on investment, uh, ownership of the art that we create, passive income in the years ahead. For example, when you sell to New Yorker, they own that in their cartoon archive or whatever it's called and they'll continue to make yep. money on it but you will not same thing with marvel and dc although they now have some smaller creative creator uh, uh fees that go out every once in a while but but you know what i'm saying here was that we do yeah. keep our head on a swivel and even though you choose against it that means you've just evaluated it and you're swiveling away and that's okay yeah and speaking of swiveling swiveling away it's time for me to say that you've been listening to comic lab and we're going to be swiveling away from you for another week <laughs> This is the show about making comics and making a living from comics. Your swiveling hosts have been my friend, but swiveling is not a fun word. That is swiveling. No, it sounds like it, it, sniveling, doesn't it? That's what it is. Yeah. It sounds like sniveling. Uh, your hosts have been my friend, Brad Geiger, the editor of webcomics.com and the creator of Evil Inc. at evil-comic.com. And my sauntering friend, Dave Kellett. See, sauntering is better. Sauntering, sauntering is, better is better than swiveling. Sauntering yeah. a little bit sounds like I got a song in my heart as I walk along. Yeah, and, and you do. The song <laughs> in the heart man, uh, Dave Kellett. <laughs> we won't say what that song is, but he's the director of Stripped and the cartoonist of Sheldon at SheldonComics.com and Drive at DriveComic.com. And the Comic Lab theme song is used with permission from our sauntering pal Andy Creighton at theworldrecord.net. And this episode was edited by the ever delightful Happy McGee. Happy McGee, that's that's the version of sauntering I come up with is Happy <laughs> McGee. Sorry, Matt. It was edited by Matt Woodard of Woodsong Productions over at www.woodsong.media. <laughs> if you love Comic Lab, you can rate and review the show on Apple Podcasts, and you may hear your review featured on a future episode. 
and Comic Lab is made possible by your support on patreon.com slash comic lab. So we'll go ahead and say that like the umpire after Dave has to take the donut off his bat. These stupid kids. These kids are so dumb. These kids are so dumb. <laughs> Dave, you think your story about having the donut on your bat was bad uh, when you were in uh, in baseball. I got to tell you, I've got one that's even worse. Goes back to my honeymoon. And uh, <laughs> we're bailing out of this. <laughs> Whatever it is, we're bailing out. <laughs> I'm turning off my microphone. I'm taking off my headphones. I'm walking out of my podcasting booth. I am not. <laughs> Swimble your way out of there. I don't want to hear this story. I don't want to be involved. I'm swiveling away.